Hi everyone, my name is Megan Gianluca. I am a PhD student at the University of Washington and I study astronomy and astrobiology. So I think a lot of people know sort of the basics of what astronomy is. It's the study of celestial bodies, stars, planets, solar systems, galaxies, and, and more. But astrobiology is a relatively new field compared to astronomy. And astrobiology is the study of life in the universe, the origin of life on Earth, the evolution of life on Earth, the search for life on other planets and in other places. And also it can encompass things like the study of habitability. So what makes a planet habitable? Is it water? Do you have to have water for life? Stuff like that. My interest in astronomy started when I was about 14 years old, and it really just started by being fascinated with the constellations. When I was 14, I got into using telescopes, and I joined the New Hampshire Astronomical Society. At 16, I did my first research project. Um, it was on a specific type of star that is the most magnetized object in the universe. And for that work, I was given the National Young Astronomers Award, and I got to give my first research presentation. That was a really enriching experience that got me super passionate about doing astronomy in the future. What I do is research science. Research science in astronomy is the process of asking questions about our universe that maybe nobody has ever asked before. And then just honestly sitting with your friends and colleagues and trying to figure out, okay, how do we even go about getting to the answer to this question? And once you think that you know the path forward, you just walk that path and try to figure out if you can get the answer. And whenever you have a breakthrough moment in your research, you get this really neat feeling of thinking, I am the only person in the world that knows this right now. And it's quickly followed up with the feeling of, I can't wait to tell everyone. What I'm currently working on in pursuit of my PhD is what makes a planet habitable to life, like temperature or water, Additionally, I like to think about how do we search for life on planets in other star systems called exoplanets. Finally, I like to think about uh, interpreting the actual observations we're taking of those exoplanets from telescopes. In particular, the stellar system that I study is the TRAPPIST-1 system, which has seven planets in it that are about Earth-sized planets. The TRAPPIST-1 system is currently one of the best places to search for life outside of the solar system, just given our current technological capabilities. It's very difficult to search for life on other planets, and the TRAPPIST-1 system happens to be one of the easier places to look. My work is helping us to interpret observations of that system, understand why their atmospheres might be the way that they are, and help us to really know if the things we're looking at could be caused by life, or if it's just probably a lifeless planet that is producing those effects. I think one of the most profound questions that we can ask is, are we alone in the universe? Because when and if that discovery happens, it's going to teach us a lot about the universe we live in and how life actually originates and evolves. Now I'm gonna answer some questions from students that have been on field trips to the Pacific Science Center. Henry asks, how can you tell if a planet far away has water? This is such an important question. Planets can have water in a lot of different places. We have the interior, so under the surface of the planet, they can have water in there. You have on the surface, like Earth's oceans, and then you can also have water in the atmosphere, like Earth's clouds, for example. It's really difficult to look at a planet that's super far away and know if it has water deep inside of the planet. And so when we're looking for water in my field, we usually stick to surface water and to water in the atmosphere. If you want to look for water on the surface, you might try and see if there's light bouncing off of that water. That's called ocean glint. And ocean glint is one thing that we can look for on exoplanets to try and tell if there's surface water there. Planets are, in a lot of cases, more likely to have water in the atmosphere, though, than on the surface. How we search for water in the atmosphere, which is the type of way that I look for water on exoplanets, is through a technique called spectroscopy. If you imagine a planet goes in front of its host star, so, for example, if the Earth goes in front of the Sun, light from that star is going to pass through the atmosphere of the planet. And if we collect that light on the other side, we can analyze it. All of these gases 
like to take away, they like to eat or absorb specific colors of light. And so if we record all of the light that passes through the atmosphere and we look at what colors are missing, we can usually tell what gases are present, including water. And so in this way, every gas in the atmosphere, like water, has a fingerprint that we look for. Owen asks, what would happen if we found something alive on another planet? What would you do? This is a super important question, and it's actually really relevant right now with the launch of new telescopes like JWST. What it boils down to is a few different guidelines, questions that we want to ask ourselves if we think we've found a sign of life. A few of those questions are like, have you properly identified your signal? Are you sure that you made a detection of what you think you made? Is life likely to produce that type of signal in the environment you're looking at? And then most importantly, do you have multiple lines of evidence to support a claim of life? You never want to make a scientific claim or statement and only have one piece of evidence to back it up. It's fine to present that evidence and say, the evidence leads me in this direction, but in particular, especially for life claims on another planet, you want to have multiple different pieces of evidence found through lots of collaboration and different research groups that support your overall conclusion that there is life on another planet. Nat asks, why haven't we found life on other planets? There's lots of reasons that we haven't detected life yet, but they all kind of boil down to it's just really, really difficult. Planets can do a lot of different things. And it's hard for us to look at a planet that's really, really far away and say for sure that there is life on that planet causing the thing that we're seeing. In addition to that, we also just haven't really had the technology to make these sorts of life detections in places outside of our solar system. Eliana asks, how far are the planets you're studying? This is a good question. I study the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. And so these planets are about 40 light years away from the Earth in the direction of the constellation of Aquarius. What that means is it takes light 40 years to travel from the TRAPPIST-1 planets to us. So when I look at the planets I'm studying in the TRAPPIST-1 system, I'm actually seeing them as they were 40 years ago. Pretty cool. Micah asks, can aliens cause climate change on their planets? If you can think about if there is some sort of life on another planet that is intelligent, technologically advanced like humans are on the Earth, absolutely they could cause climate change on their planets. And as a matter of fact, some scientists do look for signs of this. So for example, here on the Earth, refrigerants and propellants, they produce something that we call chlorofluorohydrocarbons or chlorofluorocarbons or hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Lots of tongue twisters. And these types of gases can cause climate change on our planet. They're also something you can look for in the atmosphere. And so, for example, if we look at an exoplanet and we see some of these chlorofluorocarbons in its atmosphere, we might think to ourselves, oh, there's a chance that there is an intelligent, technologically advanced civilization there that is producing all of this pollution. It was so much fun talking to you guys today about astronomy and astrobiology. I just want to tell you before I leave that you should always pursue the things that make you feel passion. The things that make you feel super interested are the things that you should be pursuing as you try and figure out what you want to do when you grow up. I would also just say that scientists are very friendly people and they love to talk about their research. So don't be afraid to just approach different researchers in the field that you're interested in and ask them questions. Special thanks to the NASA Space Grant for making this video possible. This is actually the second time that they've supported me because when I was an undergraduate, I got a NASA Space Grant to do my first research project. So with that, thank you for joining me today and stay curious.